Hi folks, this is uh, Richard Hall here from uh, Stonehenge Artero and we're looking at the night sky. Well, this time to, we're going to be looking at the entire night sky at the moment. So, pop, just popping in there. I'd always like to thank Dan Broughton who uh, supports our programme. Uh, God, Dan does lots and lots of things in Carterton. Uh, I'll, be, I'll probably be seeing him tomorrow. But anyway, uh, I thought we'd look at something special that's happening in our night skies at the moment. First of all, uh, how many of you saw the uh, the super moon and the total eclipse? I've got a variety of different um, comments from people. You know, some thought it was absolutely fabulous, and others thought it was very disappointing. You know, but what you've got to remember with the eclipse, the red moon only occurs for about ten minutes after eleven o'clock in the evening, and we can never predict exactly um, uh, how colourful it's going to be because it varies from time to time depending on atmospherics and so on uh, but anyway we, out at Stonehenge we've got a fabulous view not only that because we also had some uh, big telescopes there and you can actually look at the moon you can see the shadow traveling across the the surface of the moon anyway that was uh, last Wednesday the super eclipse and we've got some grand photographs from that as I say well what I thought I'd talk about tonight uh, or t and today is the four pillars of heaven you know, we're in a world where we've got technology all around us. At a press of a button, we get information and so on. But you've got to remember that for most of human history, it wasn't like that at all. And a knowledge of timekeeping was for our ancestors a matter of life and death. If you sailed at the wrong time of the year, you never came back. If you planted your seeds at the wrong time, your crop could fail. And actually knowing when to, to do that, at least you think of the weather that we've had recently. I know down here at the Wairapa, we've been gone from midsummer to midwinter and back again. How would you know what season you're in, right? Well, of course, our ancestors did because they were very um, uh, close to their environment and particularly the stars. And that's how they learned how to predict timekeeping and the seasons is by looking at the stars. And we know from ancient stories there was four stars, four bright stars in the sky, which were known as the four pillars of heaven. And these four pillars marked spots in the sky where once the sun entered that area, it marked a major change in the climate on Earth. So let's have a look at these four pillars. OK, first of all, if we were looking at the winter stars, which roughly we are now, actually, uh, uh, in right around about midnight, looking up there, the, looking north, as one of the um, stars is there. And we'll just bring them up there. And there it is, is Antares. And you can't miss it. It's got a beautiful orangey-red colour. And Antares uh, is the, when the sun was near Antares, that was winter. Right, and that is in the constellation of the Scorpion, also known as the Fishhook of Maui. Right, so that was the first one. Right, uh, Antares in the Scorpio. Right, then if you look at the spring stars, looking north once again at midnight, looking up there, <coughs> we have a, a bright star, <coughs> easy to pick out because there's not a bright stars around. It's away from the Milky Way, called Fomalhaut. Right, so that's Fomalhaut there, and Fomalhaut is actually well, it used to be in the constellation of Aquarius. Uh, about a couple of centuries ago, the bottom part of Aquarius was taken away and put into another constellation called the Southern Fish. Uh, but Fomalhaut was originally part of the constellation of Aquarius, right? And so that's the, that's the marker of the spring. Right now, let's have, move along a little bit. And we're now looking at the summer stars, looking north at midnight. And we here we've got, in this season, another bright star in the sky, OK? And that's Aldebaran, which is a definite orangey colour, uh, and it's in the constellation of Taurus the Bull. So you see, we had to move each three months. Remember, I'm showing you these stars as you can see them in the night sky. What I meant, as the pillars of heaven, it's where the sun was. So where the sun was at the time of uh, the, this change. Okay, so let's finally we've got the autumn stars looking north at midnight. And we have got Regulus, uh, a bluey white coloured star. Uh, also the bottom of the handle of the sickle there. And that's of course in the constellation 
of Leo the lion, all right? So those were the four pillars of heaven. So for those of you looking at this on the um, on the TV screen, you can see them up there. And of course, the immediate thing you realise is you've got the uh, four four constellations of the zodiac. And there's a good reason for that. Uh, the zodiac, uh, why it's important as it was important for people for time, it lays along the plane of the solar system so that the sun, the moon and the planets all move just through those constellations, all right? Originally, indeed, there were only four signs of the zodiac, and those are the ones that I've just been talking about, or if you've got on TV, you can see it on the screen. That was Taurus, Leo, Scorpius, and Aquarius. Those were the four signs. And then later on, it was that zodiac was divided up into, into 12 to mark out the 12 months of the year or moons because of the moon the full moon will move from one sign to another each month all right anyway looking at those what we see is that we've got the uh, equinoxes and solstices and that's exactly what these stars mark so in other words when the sun's next to Aldebaran in taurus right it's the spring equinox uh moving along then we have uh, regulus in leo marking the su summer solstice uh, Antares at the autumn equinox and then finally we have the winter solstice with um, uh, Fomalhaut there. Now solstice means the sun standing still all right? <coughs> and the reason for that is that if you actually observe the rise and setting positions of the sun you'll see it moves backwards and forwards along the horizon. Um, I often hear people say the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Well, yes, it does. It does that only on two days of the year, due east, due west, and that's at the two equinoxes. And, of course, if you come out of Stonehenge, you'll see exactly this is exactly what these stone circles do. They mark out all these spots uh, in the sky, all right, as far as the equinoxes and solstice are concerned. Solstice means the sun standing still, which it does for a while, and then it changes its direction as it's moving along the horizon. And these four days uh, were the most important days of the year. And what you'll find is that every major religious festival in the world is identified either with a solstice or an equinox. You might not think they are, because they often go by different names. We use names like Easter, Christmas, all sorts of things like that. But in fact, they were originally the solstices and the equinoxes. So that's what the four pillars of heaven actually marked. All right, so let's just have a look at them in a little bit more detail, uh, looking first of all at Taurus. Uh, now, you see, the most important of those star signs was actually Taurus the bull. And the reason for that is the, it, it marked, in the Northern Hemisphere that was, the spring equinox. And for most people around the world, the spring equinox marked the beginning of the year. Right? This was the most important day of the year because it, for people who lived in the Northern Hemisphere, it marked the return of life on Earth following the harsh Northern Hemisphere winter. The restoration of food supplies, the lambing season. It was truly a time to celebrate. Right? And even in Britain up until 1753, the year began not at the 1st of January, but in the Ides of March, the spring equinox. And you find that right the way across Europe and Asia, the spring equinox marked the beginning of the year when the sun was at Aldebaran. But the trouble is, you see, when the sun was at Aldebaran, you couldn't see it because it's occurring in your, in your daytime sky. But what our ancestors could see was this. As the sun moved to Aldebaran, the tip of the bull's tail came above the horizon in the dawn sky. And that tip of the bull's tail, right, is the Seven Sisters, the Pleiades star cluster, also known, of course, as Matariki, right? So around the world, people were using Matariki to mark out that uh, spring equinox. Incidentally, uh, for those of you watching this on TV, you have, you're have looking at this beautiful photograph of the Pleiades star cluster, right? And, um, and of course, you don't see it like that in the sky. This is a, a photograph taken with a big telescope. Uh, the big bright, there's actually a cluster of about 400, four or 500 stars, and they are embedded in a nebula, uh, of gas and dust and the this 
the bright stars, the blue light from the hot stars there is actually illuminating that gas cloud that you're in at the moment. Uh, and of course, for many people in the northern hemisphere, it's known as the Seven Sisters. Uh, well, how many stars are there? Well, as I just mentioned, there's several hundred actually, but it's about nine stars, approximately nine, with a keen eye can see them, nine stars. And they, the two are... are there's two very close together, and these are called Atlas and Pleione, and they were the mother and father, and the other seven stars were the seven sisters, their children. Right? That's what those were there. So, and I, this is this star cluster is very, very important to me because donkeys years ago, when I was young and living in England, uh, I used to study variable stars, and one of those variable stars is Pleione, the. Um, one of the, 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 the Pleiades, and she would fluctuate in brightness. Uh, you go out one night, sometimes she was as bright as Atlas, and then she'd fade away, and this was an eruptive variable star. It was the very first star I actually studied years and years ago. Anyway, so that, that was the tradition across the world that the, the year began with the rising of those seven sisters. All right? Then, around about four and a half thousand years ago, uh, the the migrations into the Pacific began and the Polynesians carried that star law with them. So to this day, Māori and that so say, the year begins at the time of the spring equinox. Uh, sorry, the time of the rising of the Pleiades. Of course, now they're on the other side of the world, right? Uh, and the fact of another thing called precession, uh, the rising of Matariki down here is actually happens quite close to the winter solstice. And in fact, in the next few days, uh, we're going to see, for those who know where to look, Matariki will be rising in the dawn sky. In that respect, I should mention that because of that, we have a special program out at, uh, out at Stonehenge on and it starts at 7 o'clock on Saturday, June the 5th. So that's next Saturday. And Kay Leather, who's a bit of an expert on, on uh, Maori, Maori style and so on, is going to be doing a special presentation on Matariki, the work of the gods. All right? So that's coming up next Saturday. Anyway, we have a little break now. And I've got some music here uh, written by Jim Wormsley. It's called Gal Galaxy Rise. Um, Jim is a friend of mine, lives in Wellington, and I, he, I used to make planetarium shows when I was at Carter Observatory, and Jim used to write some of the music. And I found this disc the other day, it's got some of that lovely music on it, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a go at playing in that.
Right, you're, uh, you're back with Richard and the, and the night sky. And we talked about the, um, the four pillars of heaven. Uh, okay, they are bright stars in the sky. So I thought I'd finish off by actually looking at these because for, for thousands and thousands of years, the stars were just shiny things in the sky, often seen as the messengers of the gods. But of course, the stars aren't. The, the stars that you can see out there are actually distant suns. Uh, and like our sun is a, the nearest star, it's just that our planet is orbiting around that star, uh, which we call the sun. And But all the planets are just the bits and pieces left over from the formation of the sun. And when you look up at that photograph of, uh, we have on the, at the moment that uh, people can see on TV, every little dot there is a distant sun. And orbiting around it are planets and worlds. But just like the planets looking at our solar system they vary enormously in their nature from jupiter saturn to the earth to mercury and so on and the same applies to the stars yeah they're all suns but they vary very enormously in what they look like and so on so briefly i just wanted to finish off by looking at the four pillars of heaven and what they really are and what we know about them okay so let's start off with first of all uh all right and of course Remember, always when we're looking at the constellations, they always appear upside down in the Southern Hemisphere because all of these things were drawn out and mapped long, long ago. OK, so first of all, we have Aldebaran, right? And it's quite noticeable. It has a yellowy colour, a yellowy orange colour. And this seems to be part of a V of stars. In fact, the little V is a, a little tiny cluster of stars. Uh, Aldebaran is not part of that. It's, it's much further away. OK, now... Aldebaran is the brightest of the four pillars of heaven, and it's actually the 14th brightest star in the sky. All right? However, it's a star that's a little bit different from our own sun. Okay, um, Its distance from us is 65 light years. So in other words, we, when we look up at Aldebaran, we're seeing it as it was 65 years ago. And it's a yellowy orange star, right? and Although its mass is only is less than twice that on the sun, it's 475 times brighter. That is because it's a gigantic star. Its diameter is 44 times that of the sun. And Aldebaran is what we call a red giant. And when a star dies, it might start... Our, and the same thing's going to happen to our sun. When our sun dies in the distant future, it will expand into a red giant in its final stages. Right, so this is a star at the final stages of its if of its existence. So once upon a time, Aldebaran would have been less bright and smaller and white, but now it's turned into this red giant. So that's Aldebaran, the first of our pillars of heaven. Right. Then moving on from that, we come to Leo the Lion, uh, and we can see that Leo the Lion in our southern spring dawn. Right, and it is the fourth of the or the fourth of in brightness as far as the four pillars go and it's the 21st brightest star in the sky but immediately you look at regulus you can see it's very different for aldebaran because it appears to have a whitish blue color and indeed it is because um aldebaran is a lot hotter uh, sorry regulus is a lot hotter than or uh, than uh, or, uh, the sun is Right. It's a B-class star. Its distance is 77 and a half light years and it is 150 times brighter than the sun. All right. So that's that's regulus out there. Uh, its diameter is just over three times that of the sun. And of course, in the not too distant future, why that I mean in stellar terms, in a few uh, tens or maybe 100 million years, uh, Regulus will turn it into a red giant like Aldebaran, and because it's a bit closer, it will then outshine Aldebaran. Okay, so that's Regulus, a bluish white star. Finally, we'll know, next we're going to have a look at the, that big bright star in Scorpius, or, which we call, um, of course, Antares. Right? And again, looking at Antares, this is Antares is the second brightest of the the pillars and the 16th brightest star in the entire sky. And Antares, like Aldebaran, has got a definite reddish colour. In fact, Aldebaran is far more red than, uh, than Aldebaran. And actually, of the pillars of heaven, this is the mightiest of stars. All right? Because when we look at it, what it really is, it's a gigantic star. Antares is 605 light years away. 
So in other words, we're seeing it as it was 600 years ago. You know, in the, what was happening in the 1400s? Well, we weren't around here then, were we? But that's when the light left that, that star to travel here, 605 light years away. And Antares is 65,000 times brighter than the sun, right? Although it's cooler than the sun, the reason why it's so bright is it's, it's got an enormous size. Its diameter is 800 times larger than that of the sun. It's what we call a red supergiant, all right? And uh, indeed, if you place Antares where the sun is right now, it's so big we would actually be inside it, all right? In addition to that, Antares is a... Um, a binary star, what we call a red supergiant, but it's got a companion. See, our sun's a single star, but a lot of stars up there have got companions. And um, Antares has got a companion, and it's a blue-white star. And indeed, if, when you look at this through a telescope, it looks absolutely magnificent. You've got this ruby-red star, and then this other little blue sapphire there uh, shining away. Uh, it's, we call it a little star, but you see this, this other blue star will be as, certainly as bright, bright as regular and a lot brighter than our sun. It's just compared with Antares, it appears small. And as I'm showing you these big bright stars, you've got to bear in mind is that um, not, these are actually quite rare. The stars in our night sky dominate the night sky are giant stars, and that's because they're so big and bright they shine out over the distances. Most of the stars out there are similar or fainter than our sun, right? but these ones stand out. And then we've got the pillar of heaven uh, in uh, what was in Aquarius in the southern hemisphere, autumn dawn, we're looking, which is Fommelhort, all right? And Fommelhort, when you look at that, it's got a definite whitish colour. And indeed, of the stars, it's the closest to the third brightest of the pillars and the 18th brightest star in the sky. But the marvellous thing about Fommelhort, it's only 25 light years away. I know that's a long way, but it's close compared with Antares and so on. Uh, but we've been studying this star recently because it's white hot. But what we discovered is it's got a, it's a very young star and it's got planets forming in around it. So we've actually discovered planets around this star, but surrounded it's embedded in a disk of matter in which new planets are being formed. So here astronomers have got a view of how things were in our solar system thousands of years ago. So, folks, that's the four pillars of heaven. Just to finally finish off to say that Stonehenge is open on weekends, school and public holidays from 10 to 4. And we have um, guided tours if you wish to go on them to take you around and show you these, these various things. We also have astronomy evenings on Friday and Saturday evenings. And just to finalise off, remember Matariki this coming Saturday at 7 o'clock at Stonehenge on June the 5th, Matariki Work of the Gods. Do come out and see that so that you'll find the wonderful stories of how Māori used the stars to understand the cycle of the seasons. And then finally, to finish off, coming at the end of the month, on June the 19th, we have got the winter solstice and we're going to be doing the legends of the winter solstice. Having said that, I'll sign off now. That's Richard and I'll catch you up in the not too distant future. <laughs>